Today we will um, do welcome and introductions and uh, we'll talk about our mission, kind of orient everyone. Uh, we have a lot of new partners that are on the call today, which is exciting uh, to what the SEOW is all about. We'll briefly overview some data products that we put out last meeting in January. Um, we have two really great presentations today. The first one is on uh, using Burfus data, uh, adverse childhood experiences. Then we'll transition to a breakout to discuss that. And then uh, we also have a great prevention education evaluation presentation. Um, as time permits, we'll go into a second breakout for that. And then uh, we will encourage members to share out any updates that they have. All right, so one of the new things that we've done this year is uh, offer continuing education hours. These continuing education hours are certified by the Delaware Certification Board and those, um, the Delaware Certification Board, excuse me, certifies uh, credentialing for, or provides credentialing for certified prevention specialists, peer recovery specialists, um, certain clinical supervision. So I invite you to check out their website to learn more about what they do. Um, and uh, these continuing education hours, you'll receive a certificate at the end if you participated in the pretest. Uh, those links were sent out, so check your email. It might have gone to your spam or something like that. But the Adverse Childhood Experiences presentation is approved for 0.75 hours. And the Delaware Rape Prevention and Education Program Building Evaluation Capacity is approved for 0.5 hours. Um, we will continue to provide these opportunities through the rest of this calendar year, as you know, folks are interested, we did it for the 3D presentation that we did a couple of months ago. Um, we'll do it again for another presentation in the fall. If there are topics of interest that you uh, uh, would like to recommend, please feel free to do that. Email myself, Sharon, Dr. Rapp, and uh, we'll see what we can do. All right, so as I mentioned at the top, my name is MJ Scales. I'm part of the facilitation team for the SEOW. I'm joined today by my uh, fearless leader, Dr. Rapp, Dr. Laura Rapp, um, known to many of you uh, as, a, as a data champion and data advocate, and also Sharon Merriman Nye, who will be emceeing most of this. She's uh, always energetic and it's exciting to work with her. Um, we've also got other members of the internal SEOW team, Rachel Writing, who I think since the last time we met has uh, become a PhD. So hand clap for that. Uh, I'm excited for her and uh, it's well worth uh, her journey has been pretty exciting. So we've also got other friends from the center. Dana Holtz is part of our team as well. Uh, Miller is here. Um, my co-host today, David Borton, other friends, uh, Bill Gratton, Dr. Rochelle Brittingham, who is uh, leading the school surveys uh, along with Jim, who's not here today. And uh, our director is here as well, Dr. Vischer. I think that's it from the center. Who am I missing? Rachel Schilling, excuse me. Dr. Cheryl Ackerman, who's our second presenter. Um, who else am I missing from CDEX? Eileen Sparling, who is the PI on AWARE is also here today. Um, do, 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 do. Am I missing anyone else from the center? Dr. Rapp, help me out. You said, you said Dana Holtz, right? I did, I did, I did. Yeah, all right, and so um, if, oh, uh, Solange has joined us. Solange is leading up a lot of the uh, state opioid response evaluation and some other new projects that have come into the state. So we're excited to have many representatives from CDAS. We work on a variety of different projects and uh, we hope that, uh, you know, we provide resources to you across the board. And if you are new to us, we invite you to unmute yourself as you feel comfortable to do so to introduce yourself if this is your first SEOW meeting. Um, if it's not, you can introduce yourself in the chat or if you don't feel like unmuting yourself, the caffeine hasn't hit yet this morning, uh, feel free to also introduce yourself in the chat. Would anyone like to unmute themselves and introduce themselves, a, a new person today? Good morning. This is 
This is Kate Brookins from the Division of Public Health, and this is my first meeting here. Um, I do have a team of uh, folks here uh, with me, and I don't have the list in front of me, but I believe it's Matthew Newman, Katie Capelli. Um, we are all from the Office of Health Crisis Response. Our office is still fairly new, um, just, just a little over two years, and we were formed um, as a need uh, for the response to the opioid epidemic from a public health perspective. Um, we have been working um, um, fairly heavily here in our office to identify uh, data and surveillance um, activities that we can help coordinate on behalf of public health. Um, so we will hopefully have some data to contribute to the, to the conversation. Um, a lot of the work that we do in our office overall is prevention um, and community education. Um, so there is lots of um, initiatives that, that we oversee on behalf of our office as well. And if uh, Matthew and Katie want to jump in and uh, say a few words, they can do so. Hi, I'm Katie Capelli, and I'm a planner for in the Office of Health Crisis Response. Again, as Kate said, working on the opioid crisis. Well, welcome to all three of you. That's exciting. That's exciting work. It's such worthwhile work. And um, I know we have some partners who are joining who are doing some prevention work in the community around opioids. We have other partners um, who are um, contributing to that work in, in various ways. So thank you so much for, for joining. And I'm excited to hear more about your work, uh, especially as it relates to the data. Was there anyone else? Hey folks, this is Karen McLaughlin. Um, this is not my first meeting, but it's been a while since I've, I've done this. I'm the uh, director for the Rape Prevention and Education Program, and I just wanted to comment that I'm really grateful that the University of Delaware and all their partners are delving into evaluation, which is really kind of difficult for a lot of folks. Most of us are not formally trained in evaluation. So I think it's wonderful work that you're doing and I appreciate you being here. And hi to all my friends. I see all wonderful faces. <laughs> Thanks so much. We like evaluation for the most part, right? Dr. Rapp? <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> right? So we appreciate that. We're excited, yeah. Go ahead, sorry, Doc. I was just gonna say, welcome back, Karen. It's good to see your face this time, Ms. McLaughlin. You and I were in a meeting a couple of weeks ago and both of us opted to not have our cameras on that time. So it's good to see your face. We have so many Zoom meetings. Sometimes it's nice to be incognito. And I may, yeah, I may um, drop out just visually because it's the bandwidth. You know, Delaware needs to improve its bandwidth. <laughs> but that's, it so, is, that's so true. Dr. Rapp? Oh, yeah. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Laura. Uh, welcome to all the new folks again. I just wanted to take a minute to orient everyone to the four goals of the SCOW. SAMHSA originally had like a call to action of every state creating an SCOW, uh, which was funded or is funded through the Division of Substance Abuse and Mental Health here in Delaware. Shout out to DCU. Um, it was originally funded under the SIG grant, the state incentive grant, but then it found a home through the SPF SIG and then the SPF PFS and now the block grant. And the SEOW has been around since 2007. And over that time, we've seen it kind of change and morph as different substances come into play and different needs arise. But these four goals have kind of always oriented our work. So I just wanted to go over them really quickly. The first is to identify, analyze, and share data. This is something that the SCOW does routinely, as well as I believe probably most people on this call too. When I was thinking of this goal in particular, there's one example that really comes to mind, and that is the annual epidemiological report. This is probably the biggest lift of the SCOW. It pulls from over 20 different data sources that are updated or that are as up-to-date data-wise as we can on a variety of different substances and related factors so that we have this understanding of what the data for behavioral health looks like for Delaware and for our communities. 
The 2021 report is currently underway and should be out to all of you in a few months, which is really exciting. And even with all the data disruptions around COVID, we were still able to add some new data sources or some new data measures this year, particular or ones that we're particularly interested in are around ACES from the Delaware School Survey. And there were two new components. It was around whether or not a youth lived with someone who uses substances or someone um, with mental health issues. So that will be included in the 2021 EPI, which I think a lot of people on this call will be interested in, and also relates to one of our presentations coming up today from Dr. Husseini. And then another thing I wanted to point out is that there's going to be a specific chapter in the 2021 report on COVID and some early data that was released on how COVID impacts substance use as well as access to resources. The second goal of the SCOW is to create data guided products with the hopeful step of that it will inform planning and policy at a community and state level. And I really think this is actually a sweet spot of the SEOW. One of the things that really motivates us and motivates this work is taking data and translating it into action. I think that's something that our team is passionate about and a lot of you are passionate about as well in your work. And Maisha in a few minutes is actually gonna go over a few products that the SEOW has recently put forth where we're taking that data and putting it into visual format. So hopefully it can be used for planning purposes and policy development at an organization, community or state level. And when we did the 2020 SEOW satisfaction survey, one of the things that we heard from all of you was that you routinely use the data to inform your programs and to plan. And very excitingly, you also regularly use the data to inform policy. And one SCOW member gave us a wonderful example of using the data to inform the Delaware State Health Improvement Plan, which is something that's incredibly important for the state of Delaware. The third goal is training communities in understanding, using, and presenting data. This is something that the SEO really does a lot of times one-on-one -on -one with different stakeholders. But more recently, the 3D event that took place at the end of June that was hosted by Sharon Merriman I and Drs. Holtz and Riding also took some specific set time with at least 30 participants, I think, and walked through how you can find and use data to support behavioral health programs here in Delaware here in your communities and here with the groups that you all work with. Um, they also took the time to walk through two concrete examples of how to find and use data using the Kids Count data portal as well as DPH's My Healthy Community data portal. Another example of this, of um, trying to support and elevate the understanding of data use around behavioral health in Delaware is through the recent publication that came out through the Delaware Journal of Public Health, co-authored by Sharon and Jim Heiberger, that was on the nuances of mapping as a public health tool specific to Delaware. If you haven't checked it out, I would encourage you to do so. So that though is not Jim Heiberger's only notable contribution this year. He and his partner, Aaron, also welcomed a baby boy earlier this summer. So for those of you who know Jim, he is loving fatherhood and he and Aaron are both doing really well. So we wanted to kind of give that update to the group. That's not a formal SCOW goal though. So we'll keep moving that along. So goal four is building state and local level monitoring systems. This goal is actually accomplished through the ongoing strengthening and developing of the SCOW network. So it's actually your engagement that makes this goal a success. The SCOW is only as strong as its members and each of you engages in data in your work, either as a data creator, a data user, or a data questioner. Someone who can look at the data and say, that's not speaking to the individuals that I work with, or there are gaps in our knowledge. How can we address them? We currently have over 100 people in our SCOW network representing agencies, and stakeholders throughout the state. And it's very exciting that today we have a number of new members. 
So thank you for your engagement in SCOW, and I hope this helped orient all of us as to the important work of data usage in planning and in informing for the state of Delaware. I'm gonna turn it back over to Misha for the new products. Thanks, Dr. Rapp. Mm -hmm. Um, as Dr. Rupp mentioned, we've got um, since the be or since January when we all met, we have uh, created drafted uh, three new infographics which are available on our website. When you get this slide deck, the links will be live. I'll show them to you in just a minute. Um, most recently, we did one on LGBTQ plus affirming spaces. Uh, we also did an infographic on driving and substance use, and we used we looked at some national data as well as Delaware data. And then uh, I believe it was February, uh, we put out a infographic around behavior using, excuse me, including behavioral health data uh, relevant to Black and African American youth in Delaware. As um, Dr. Rapp also mentioned, um, in the most recent issue of the Delaware Journal of Public Health, uh, Sharon and Jim uh, collaborated on a piece around the uh, nuances of mapping as a public health tool. It's really very interesting. I invite you to check it out. Um, this link, I believe, is also live when you get the slides, um, and they were also distributed through the email listserv, all of these items, so you may already have them, but you can also check them out on our website, which those links are in the chat, um, and we hope that these will be valuable to you. Uh, we also did for peeps, people who are not as familiar with the work of the SCOW, uh, Sharon did a great write-up in the journal around what is the Delaware SCOW. So the most recent product we developed, of course, was the LGBTQ plus affirming spaces. Um, what was really important for us is that um, we take a look at what's happening with young people in Delaware, but also to provide some and why that's important. So what's happening, why it's important, and what are some ways, action steps that people can take? As, as Dr. Rapp pointed out, we really are very passionate about um, the data coming alive for people and being relevant for people and hopefully informing some action. It's great to have awareness, to raise that awareness. Now we need to take that um, and, and put that into some kind of action. Uh, and we see this a lot with being trauma-informed, being trauma-responsive, right? So this was a really great um, data product. We did use the Youth Risk Behavior Survey uh, for this product. And um, if you wanna see the exact question that's there on the left, if you'd like to take a look at this data yourself, we bought, this is a live, um, infographic with interactive uh, links, and uh, you can access the information from that portal yourself. And there's also some resources learning more about, um, uh, you know, different elements of this uh, product. Um, we also did another simpler one around driving and substance use. And we looked at some of the, um, I think we used Delaware School Survey, no, we used, uh, yeah, Delaware School Survey for this, sorry, it was, four or five months ago, I tend to forget, sorry. Um, we looked at some of the uh, Delaware School Survey data and we looked at um, 11th graders who should be in that uh, driving range or who may be in that driving age range and some of their responses, uh, the risk behavior, we looked specifically at, at alcohol and marijuana um, because we know that that has an impact on uh, coordination and driving and, and judgment and things like that. And, um, I will say as a, as a mom of a kid who's about to be 15, some of it was a little bit like, mm, that's alarming. So I think that's a place for us to lean in around, um, you know, prevention and, and other things. Uh, and then most far back, I think this was February, possibly early March, we developed an infographic um, that looks at some of the behavioral health indicators for Black and African American youth in Delaware and where the needs are for leaning in. We did not, when we created this product, we didn't look at it from a disparity, um, uh, with a disparity lens, like how does this compare to others? We really looked at what are the needs of Black and African American youth in Delaware and how can we support them? Again, it was important for us to include some resources that uh, were helpful to the reader and the person who takes this in. I got to wrap it's your turn then. Okay, so last meeting, um, we started the Data Champions with Dr. Gloria James and Dr. Bill Lynch um, being recognized for their contributions to the behavioral health data world in Delaware. And we would like to keep that going. Um, so the Data Champion is really about 
who engages with the data, either as the, like I said, the data producer, the data user, the data questioner, it can be done in so many different ways. And the SEOW is all oriented around data and data usage and translating data into something meaningful. We're very fortunate that we have many amazing data champions. So we just wanna take a little bit of time each meeting to recognize your contributions to the SCOW, but also recognize the contributions that you do in your professional and oftentimes personal life to help improve the lives of Delawareans. So with that said, we wanna recognize a special data champion today, drum roll. And we want to say thank you to the Delaware Council on Gambling Problems. I know that Judy McCormick is here. Yes, I pull her hands. I dig it. Um, we want to take a few minutes and thank the data champion of Delaware Council on Gambling Problems and Judy McCormick for all the great work they do with data. Uh, Judy and the DCG have been engaged with the SEOW for many, many, many years. They have presented data at SEOW meetings. They've been involved with planning committees for the SEOW. They are also consistently standing up at the end of meetings when we were in person and promoting their events, but also cross-promoting other partners' events too. And one of the things that I really appreciate and value about the Delaware Council on Gambling Problem um, is that they are an incredibly strong data advocate and data user. Sharon actually says quite a bit, risk is risk is risk. And I think the Delaware Council on Gambling Problems has pushed that for the inclusion of gambling and the relationship between gambling and substance use. And we know for youth, there's a relationship between gambling behaviors and substance use. There's a relationship between gambling and school attendance. And Judy and the team that she works with and the Delaware Council on Gambling Problems have been an outspoken advocate for looking at how gambling problems and risky behaviors are all tied together with all of the work that really a lot of other people on this call do as well. We all have our own angle. We all have our own call to action when it comes to how we interact with data. But the Delaware Council on Gambling Problems has been a, an amazing advocate for looking beyond specific variables and seeing the connection between all of our areas of interest and all of our areas of passion. So I want to take a minute and recognize Judy McCormick and the Delaware Council on Gambling Problems for all of the great work they do and as being strong data champions in the state of Delaware. Thank you very much. And I'll do a round of applause because I'm not on mute. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And Judy, you guys will be getting this beautiful PDF to do whatever you want with. You can print out a hundred and wallpaper your wall with it. You can use it as I wrapping do paper. That. Yep, it's on you. You do you. So, but thank you. It's Sincerely, thank surprise. you for all the work. <laughs> so, thanks so much, Dr. Rapp. And I, you know, I want to pick you back on that. I, you know, a few years back came to Delaware as a, um, and started at DCM. And ever since I've engaged with the SEOW, whenever Ms. McCormick presents data, I'm always learning something. So not only is she using data, um, I'm always learning things. Whenever I see that um, she's got a presentation coming up, I try to um, make time in my schedule to attend that because it's always so informative. I learn things. Um, you know, I know for me, gambling and youth was not something that ever occurred to me, um, you know, many years ago. And so I find uh, presentations and data and the way they incorporate data into their work is, is super helpful and, and raises my awareness to a degree that I appreciate. So thank you for that. Oh, thank you for the recognition. I really appreciate that. And that's, we've been saying and gambling for years. So we really, we really appreciate that. Now we say and gambling and gaming. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody. Thank you so much. Now I'm gonna turn- MJ, I have a question yes. for you before we move on. Of course. And mostly because of just recognizing Judy and her group, which congratulations on that. But I'm wondering if SEOW is going to engage in looking at this with high school students and college students with some of your survey data now, because I can tell you from the hospital point of view that this problem with gambling during the pandemic has exploded. So in conversations with actually youth in college, 
one of his friends has a friend who has gambled into $15,000 worth of debt as a college student. And so what I'm wondering is that I think that this has gotten to be quite significant, especially with all these apps now that they can do it with. Um, is there a way, and I'm sure Judy's group can lead you with that, is are there ways to put certain questions about this now into the high school surveys, into the college surveys, so that we can get an idea of how bad this problem is in Delaware and then engage in some harm reduction and prevention programs to help address it along with Judy's group. And that data I'm sure would be helpful to her and her colleagues. So Dr. Lynch, thank you for, for that question. Um, we do have some gambling and uh, questions on the, I believe it's the Delaware School Survey. So towards the end, um, maybe we can all kind of connect and, and figure out next steps. And when we send out resources after this, we can make sure that folks get um, some of the information from the Delaware School Survey. Dr. Rapp, I don't know if you have anything you want to add about the College Risk Behavior Survey. Yeah, it's it's usually um, on like a sick like a cycle with the College Risk Behavior Survey. But Judy and her team have advocated for gambling and gaming questions to be included on the youth surveys and the College Risk Behavior Survey for a number of years. And and was successful. Um, and we've reported out on that data as well in some specific products, but I'm pretty sure that the data also goes back to you, correct, Judy, for usage? Right? Oh, yeah. And yeah. We, we use the YRBS, we use the College Risk Survey, we use the Delaware School Survey, and then we do our own um, survey that we do in the schools when we do our, our presentations. So we've, we've actually got a pretty rich um, background in data. Um, we just, it's not as prominent as other things. People haven't asked about it until now. And it really, to be honest with you, until we started linking with the video gaming behavior, which has become really big, um, I, I don't think that gambling was really on anybody's radar, but um, we have the SEOW to thank for the fact that we've been able to get data that we can use and, you know, with a little finagling and, and gambling and reminding people that we're out there and that this is a problem, it's just not as obvious as substance use and it's not federally funded, which is a huge issue. So I'm hoping in the, you know, in the future sometime, we can use the data that we get from the SEOW to help other states as well as our own recognize that this isn't just a state issue, it's a federal issue. R really quick to speak to the question about, the, you know, the COVID impacts. Um, we just finished all of our data analysis from the middle school and high schools from our basically from January till June. So very recently, and there were double digit increases in percentage um, from the amount of the amount of time kids are playing video games from 29% to 41% um, over four hours a day. So 41% of our sixth to 12th graders are playing over four hours a day. That's a that's a lot of time. I would just like to say that we have broken out the data and it is actually included in a chapter in the EPI report. So for folks that are interested, we can pull up, you know, you can pull up that information. Um, and I believe, I'm not 100% sure, we may have an infographic on that data as well. But if not, it certainly sounds like something we should do. Um, on my wish list is a heat map too. Well, that. That is an interesting thought, actually. I mean, because we do use the questions on the Delaware School Survey, so we could pull up information on that. All right, well, congratulations again. We're so excited that you are you. part of this network and such a great um, advocate for collecting data, supporting. You've supported very heartily the collection of data, um, materially as well, and you have um, you know, been a great partner at the table. So. Thank you for that. MJ, um, is it possible to share the screen with Dr. Husseini now? Because I think um, I'm there. I'm, I'm no, I don't. Sorry. sorry. I don't need to share the screen with Dr. Husseini. He can just share screen when he's ready, if you'd like an introduction, chat. All right. So I'm going to segue into the introduction for Dr. Husseini now. Um, as you know, uh, 
I think most of you do know him in the room. Um, he is a senior scientist for the uh, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. And he has been since 2016, the maternal and child health assignee to the Delaware Division of Public Health. So he's been here for quite a while and he's been a wonderful, wonderful advocate for children's health, for maternal health and for um, very globally looking at risk that um, happens in early life that carries through and has significant implications for health and well-being. He's also an adjunct professor and researcher at the University of Arizona. And in addition to uh, the maternal and child health emphasis, he's got other areas of research that include health informatics, population health, behavioral health, and substance use. Um, he's been a very prolific researcher, many publications, conference presentations, and professional affiliations, but we are very fortunate because he's been here a number of times. He's presented in Delaware a number of times, and we are grateful to have him back today to talk a little bit more about adverse childhood experiences. Um, in the past, you've heard him talk a lot about the child data that we get um, from the National Survey on Children's Health, from the Youth Risk Behavior Survey, um, but, but today he's going to expand on that and he's going to talk about adult um, experiences with uh, adverse childhood events. Um, we've collected for the first time in Delaware on the Burfus survey data on ACEs among adults, and he's going to highlight that in his discussion today. So I want to turn it over to Dr. Khalil Husseini. I want to thank you again for being such a great partner. Um, to us in the SEOW for sharing all of your knowledge and wisdom and for talking about this topic once again. So here we go. Um, thank, thank you, um, Sharon. Um, I hope everybody can hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear me. If I need to, I usually try to. It's fantastic. Great. Um, thank you, Sharon, again. And I'm Jay for having me here, Dr. Rat, uh, for having me here. Thank you, all of my uh, public health colleagues who have um, who have been fighting this uh, COVID battle, um, taking on new responsibilities um, and uh, kind of um, helping um, Delaware and the rest of the nation kind of move forward uh, with what we are uh, experiencing. And uh, <clears throat> before I kind of jump into the presentation, I wanted to thank Dale. Um, who is, um, who is the uh, BRFSS um, uh, coordinator in the uh, Division of Public Health uh, for always being uh, very supportive. His predecessor, Fred B, um, who retired, all, also was a very um, great uh, supporter. Um, and I kind of uh, really enjoy being with all of your colleagues. Um, so with that, um, I wanted to kind of um, start off the presentation with a couple of um, you know, important things, um, you know, uh, as we go along. Uh, and, and I don't want this to be a kind of a monologue. And if you have any questions, please do. Uh, if I'm going through some of the slides uh, really fast, you know, please stop and uh, feel free to ask questions. Uh, there will be at the end of the uh, presentation, it's more of a dialogue as opportunities and challenges. We could do that as well, uh, if you rather prefer that. So with that, um, let's see. Um, I just, this is a generic disclaimer. Um, it's probably uh, very familiar to a lot of you. Um, it, you know, all these are my opinions and uh, uh, it's not necessarily represent the official position of the uh, CDC, nor the Delaware Health and Social Solution Division of Public Health. I have nothing to disclose. Um, so the, here's the outline. This is how I'm kind of going to uh, kind of lay down um, the topic for today's uh, discussion, uh, basically kind of really want to frame um, the ACEs. There's, there's a lot of discussion. Um, there are a lot of folks here who are experts who kind of worked in the field for a very long time, but I want to kind of frame this in two key uh, areas. One is the, the whole life course framework, which Sharon earlier alluded to um, and um, how they interact with ACEs. Um, and, uh, you know, how ACEs, of course, impact overall well-being. Um, very briefly, I'm going to kind of take a presentation that I've done previously on Delaware ACEs 
And the reason I'm doing this recap is to kind of really show you that trajectory. So it's, it's not kind of, you know, I'm, I'm showing another piece of data and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping uh, that, you know, you will be able to draw those connections. Then of course, we'll dive into the uh, behavior risk factor surveillance system in Delaware. Um, and then uh, obviously it's again, it's cross-sectional. So it's basically a snapshot in time. Uh, we'll summarize an opportunity and channel, um, challenges. Uh, this is where I want us to kind of engage actively to be able to ask questions and see where do we find these opportunities and what do you think are the challenges? With that, you know, what are really the ACEs? You know, so the original ACE categories uh, by Felitti et, et al. in their seminal article um, as part of their Kaiser Permanente uh, work um, in a very clinical uh, setting kind of, you know, used uh, these three categories, you have the psychological abuse, physical abuse, and then contact sexual abuse. And then you have four categories or domains of exposure, which are basically household uh, dysfunction during the childhood. You know, so there is some question on exposure to substance use, some uh, with respect to mental illness, violent treatment of mother or parent or stepmother. Um, criminal behavior, there was one question. So this is the original um, ACEs. And over time, the questionnaires, depending on the survey, has have changed. And, and, and the reasons um, for the changes have been uh, somewhat either pragmatic or who the audience is, who are we asking these questions. Um, so we're not going to dive into those discussions, but you know, um, you know, if you find something that is um, you know, um, you know, not what would you conceptually have understood as an adverse childhood experience. You know, we, we can kind of talk about uh, about that. Um, so, what is the evidence? We all know there's compelling evidence uh, with the systematic reviews and meta analysis, which talk about uh, the impact of ACEs on um, oral health and uh, behavior. So, and I think the more I think the, the this is now fairly uh, older field with respect to epigenetics, how early childhood experiences actually impacting in methylation, basically in terms of really impacting how, um, you know, uh, this is like your gene and environment interactions essentially, and how that can really transform um, what, what is gonna happen to you. Um, and obviously, there's a huge financial com uh, components. One of the estimates that uh, talk about lifetime costs with uh, child maltreatment is about $124 billion. Um, and then I think this is going to be the core where we really talk about the life course. Um, and I really, I think if there is one takeaway you want to kind of um, take from this presentation is the importance how this um, um, uh, the, the framework that we want to kind of really understand uh, adverse childhood experience from and, uh, and the opportunities, because we're always talking about primary uh, prevention, where are the opportunities for prevention are? And so, and this is another slide which basically talks about life expectancy, 80 years um, on average, uh, you know, for somebody who may or may not have experience and um, those with um, ACEs are more 60 years. So that kind of almost 20 years early on average, those, um, uh, the life expectancy um, is reduced. Um, so what is basically quickly what the life course framework is? It's basically a theoretical paper that kind of really talks about social pathways, developmental trajectories, you know, it basically guides human lives in, um, uh, within context. Uh, in epidemiology, it was popularized as womb to tomb. <laughs> you know, it's kind of kind of morbid, but uh, it's interesting. You know, it's, uh, you know, it's a lot of lot of this is happening um, even before the uh, uh, you know birth of the infant. It's happening in the mother's womb, and then uh, in sociology, you know, the opposite, uh, cradle to um, grave, um, and and it's usually continuous in scope. What we mean by that is. Um, you know, there is a time and space element for this. And so you have to understand these trajectories um, over not just, you know, years, uh, we're really talking about generation. So, um, and within this um, life course epidemiology, there are two fundamental um, schools of thought, if, 
uh, if I may use the word, uh, you, usually the developmental um, trajectory where the ACE has fallen, it's basically socially patterned experiences, risk and protective factors, uh, and critical sensitive times uh, in your life that um, you know, um, changes the course of your health um, and well-being. Um, kind of uh, a lot of emphasis on biological and behavioral aspects of that. And then the second part, um, you know, is the structural part, which we're really talking about the social determinants of health, how, um, you know, the socially uh, patterned environments, disproportionate um, um, uh, allocation of resources, um, you know, alter our health trajectories, you know, and so, and there is an emphasis on chronic stresses accumulates, um, accumulating, um, you know, over time, over life course. Um, and in, in, in MCH epidemiology, we talk about this as uh, allostatic load. Um, so that's kind of a quick background. Um, and so there's this nice little um, diagram, uh, uh, you know, diagram, and it's, I apologize, it's not as, uh, as clear as I would uh, like it. But, you know, if you guys are interested, I have the reference there, you know, I would encourage you guys to uh, look at it. But basically, there are two uh, figures here, figure A and figure B. One really talks about how um, the, the, the healthy uh, trajectory, the poor health trajectory, the risk and protective factors, and the relative frequency of number of risk factors over, over your, uh, uh, you know, uh, different stages of life, how they kind of put you in either the positive or the blue line, the healthy trajectory, or uh, it put you on a poor health trajectory. And then, you know, um, what those at risk uh, factors might be. And the figure B is rather kind of really telling us an important point that the, they may not uh, be as linear as we think. Um, so they fluctuate over time uh, and one can move um, you know, um, you know, with depending on the resources, depending on the protective factors, up and down, and and that's one of the focuses on uh, of health development in, in figure B. So on top you have something that is really cumulative and numbers. On the second, it really is emphasizing that it's not necessarily linear all the time. So if you start off and this is the trajectory you're going to follow. Uh, and so a lot of the epidemiologists, and they include me, we kind of really talk about the uh, figure B, which is uh, nonlinear pattern. So given this broad theoretical context, you know, you know, I want to kind of pause for a, uh, you know, for a second to kind of take this image. And I think the first time in 2016 when I did the presentation, I had this image, kind of really look at um, what ACEs are, and this is these are F um, fMRI scans of a normal brain in a extreme a brain that of a child that is extremely neglected. And for those who are in the field of education, I really want you to think about this when you're talking about early childhood education, when you're talking about, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, kids who are entering ready to learn. And when you're talking about uh, kids who are trying to, who have behavioral problems at the beginning in the elementary school and other kinds of stuff, and we're trying to kind of change this trajectory. So they've already started out, you know, um, at, at, a, at a, you know, comparative disadvantage. Um, and there's this other image really talking about, kind of uh, talking about the life score in a more uh, compact way as to what it kind, how it impacts the, 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 the brain development. Okay. Um, so, Having said that, I want to kind of present data that is uh, from National Survey of Children's Health, which um, you know quickly talks about what's happening in Delaware. You know, um, in National Survey of Children's Health, um, you know, the way the ACEs are captured are slightly different. Um, you know, so you have something uh, as hard to cover basis like food or housing, uh, parent or guardian. So there, are, there are some questions on household dysfunction. And there are some questions on um, mental illness, but there's no question actually on sexual contact, uh, which is one of the core aspects of ACEs. And so that's one fundamental uh, difference. And there's an interesting item there, which is also talking about perceived discrimination. And, and the reason the sexual contact, uh, to kind of give you an idea about why it is not 
um, yes, just because these are all parental reports or the guardian's report of ACEs for their children, zero to 17. Okay, so, and so this is, I'm going to go through this because we've kind of uh, gone through the slides, uh, but if you, if you look at it, almost one in three Delaware children, 12 to 17 year olds, um, you know, have two or more um, ACEs, um, you know, one in five, six to 11 year olds. And I really want you guys to contextualize. We're talking about one in five children who are coming already have indicated they've had two or more adverse childhood experiences. Um, and so when we look at the trends here, um, uh, when compared to nationally, you know, ACE is two in terms of the uh, item two is basically a parental separation or divorce. Um, you know, you see um, in a slightly higher rate. And interesting, interestingly, um, this was something that as a, as a sociologist and an epidemiologist, which is very interesting to me, the item nine, uh, perceived discrimination being treated unfairly because of race, uh, over time seems to have increased. Um, so, um, you know, uh, Delaware has seen a lot more, um, uh, much higher percentage of increase uh, with respect to that particular item in AIDS. Um, yeah, other items, you know, you can see in terms of violence, Delaware has uh, item six. Uh, Delaware has always fared higher, uh, na higher than um, the U.S. Um, and so that is a big, um, uh, you know, I guess a, a factor that we need to really talk about violence, um, uh, you know, uh, with, among children. Um, then when you break down this by uh, race and ethnicity, uh, you know, you, you see some interesting patterns. One in three African American or Black children and non-Hispanic um, say that they have experienced two or more of their childhood experiences. Um, and then when you actually say, when we're talking about, okay, how does this really relate to health? So when you actually stratify this, um, you know, you see almost, uh, uh, you know, 10% uh, of those who are um, unexposed, you know, the BMI um, or are or, or overweight or being children in here, um, you know, it's almost 25 percent, one in four. Um, so you're you're starting off or looking at it uh, much early on, um, and so with that, I I want you to keep the early the, the children's data of ACEs early on. Now we're going to switch to the core of our presentation, which is the uh, BRFIS, um, which is a survey for all 18 and older. Um, in Delaware. It's a collaborative project between the CDC and the states, uh, and it's one of the largest surveys in the world uh, with some, some of the highest response rates of almost 49 to 50% uh, compared to some other national surveys. Um, and it collects data on a variety of um, uh, health-related re risk behaviors, chronic health conditions, and preventative services. Um, and usually is over 400,000 adult interviews each year. Um, and Delaware has been collecting this data continuously since 1990 with approximately 4,000 responses. So the 2019 data is what I'm presenting. I just wanted to kind of give you a quick background about the sample characteristics. So we had, uh, you know, for those who want to kind of get um, technical on this, the composition is both landline surveys and cell phone surveys. Um, uh, that are interviews that are done in Burfitts. Um, and increasingly there's uh, more and more re research from the, the uh, survey methodology that, you know, uh, landlines kind of traditionally kind of literally disappeared. It's cell phones, uh, are, you know, a percentage of folks who actually use cell phones um, are much higher. And so there is increasing emphasis in Delaware um, and nationally uh, to kind of get this a large, larger sample size uh, for, um, you know, um, uh, to get larger sample and representative sample of the cell phone users, um, which means that the costs of the survey go dramatically higher. So average number of attempts before you kind of get an interview is about 3.4. So um, you're looking at the response, combined response rate of cell phone and line at 38%. You're saying, oh, how am I going to take that? You know, so yeah, the response rate is lower. And uh, we've been working very hard to kind of get that for Delaware. There are states that have a response rate of 70%, 60%. Uh, 
And um, as stakeholders, I'm going to make a pitch, not just for Dale. I mean, Dale always does the pitch, but for all of you to really talk about the importance of the survey. And if you're going to use the data as the response rate starts, you know, you start, uh, you know, uh, the generalizability and the, the standard errors kind of dramatically start increasing. And so, um, you know, there's going to be less and less confidence. And, and, and Delaware historically has had kind of, uh, you know, there, there were a couple of years ago, it had over 40%, but, you know, it's kind of remained below 40% for quite some time. So please make a pitch about um, when people get that call, answer. I've done birth for service twice in my life, one time in Arizona and once here. So just to kind of give you a quick sample here, uh, you know, a fairly representative sample of all adults in Delaware. <clears throat> Um, and when we come to ACES, um, this is how the question is phrased. Um, it, the interviewer basically asks, I would like to ask some questions. It's kind of pretty uh, self-explanatory, and so I'm not going to read the whole thing. Uh, but these are all recollection. So this is the key thing that I want you to take away. These are recollection of ACES before 18 years of age. That's the key. So when, when you look at the data, you need to keep that in perspective. Um, we saw the child survey where we're asking the parent uh, about whether the child experienced or not. Now, these are adults um, who are recollecting their childhood experiences. So these are the, your classic questions in BRFIS. Um, you know, the first um, six questions and the um, you know, um, are, you know, your traditional yes or no kind of questions, or, you know, they have your household, dis um, household dysfunctions uh, questions. Um, and the six through 11, you know, basically are questions that um, are kind of, you know, like a uh, type of scale format, um, you know, with once, more than once, um, you know, it's kind of coded that way. Uh, but in any case, um, you know, you have the sexual contact, the traditional questions, you have household dysfunction, and you also have, um, uh, you know, uh, items you know, of, um, of violence. So what do the responses look like? 43% um, of adults in Delaware 18 or older were exposed. We're really talking to two or more ACEs, 23%. Uh, to one, and um, about a third of them said they've never, or they do not recollect any adverse childhood experiences. What does the distribution look like? <clears throat> so if, if you look at the table here, uh, one of the things that I, I guess, you know, you see, um, um, you know, what do you see uh, a, higher, a higher prevalence, similar to in, uh, you know, the children's health data, is the parental separation or divorce, which is you know the majority, followed by um, you know living with somebody who is you know a problem drinker or an alcoholic, and now now that you know we have somebody who's also talking about gambling, and you know it would be interesting to see <laughs> you know to kind of add that as an important element, and we probably know how many of them you know how that prevalence will go up. Um, so um, that so those are the two top. Uh, then you have, of course, um, mental illness, which is which is the next top uh, list. Uh, the percent of uh, individuals who really talk about prevalence is about seventeen percent, uh, who said they lived with somebody who was depressed or mentally ill or suicidal. Um, um, and then you have other categories in terms of uh, parental violence, which is about eighteen percent. Um, then you have, um, you know, uh, physical violence. Um, and then in terms of the sexual violence, it is extremely personal, but at least one in 10 individuals, 18 and older, recollected that um, somebody had touched them sexually. Um, and then about 8%, um, you know, um, indicated that they were made to touch someone else um, sexually. And, um, you know, we're going to be talking about rape prevention, but, you know, um, we're talking about uh, forced, um, um, forced to have sex. Um, almost 5% uh, of adults, um, you know, the numbers might say once or I mean, if you take the 5% of 18 and older population in Delaware, that amounts to uh, a very large uh, amount of people. 
uh, who, uh, who recollected that they were um, uh, forced to have sex. Um, so when we stratify, um, you know, uh, ACEs by uh, gender and age, uh, you see, I mean, uh, you know, in general, um, two or more um, ACEs are, um, there's a six percentage points difference among men and women who recollect the ACEs. Um, and uh, interestingly, the, the recollection of ACEs is, um, you know, uh, the prevalence is higher in younger um, cohort, uh, you know, 18 to 24, 25, and kind of declines with age. And that's, that's probably because of the amount of recollection or uh, painful experience they've got. So, um, so the recollection is much higher in the, when you're younger uh, than when you're in age older. Um, when you kind of look at by education and income, uh, there are some differences, but, you know, in general, um, you know, um, uh, with respect to two or more ACEs, uh, those with uh, lower levels of socioeconomic status um, seem to have, uh, you know, higher, generally higher prevalence of um, um, ACE, uh, ACEs, uh, experiencing two or more ACEs. When you actually look at by race and place, um, you know, um, you, you see um, uh, both uh, white non-Hispanic and uh, black non-Hispanic have a higher percentage of, uh, um, uh, higher prevalence of uh, two or more ACEs. Um, and then um, not a whole lot of differences in um, uh, by place, although if you see uh, it's, uh, Newcastle County comes as uh, much lower compared to Kent and Sussex County, which is the highest in terms of the prevalence estimates for um, ACEs. So, now, when we go back to really thinking about, okay, we talked about this, how do we kind of, um, how does this uh, translate to health or health uh, and, and behaviors? So when you look at it, um, I'm sorry, um, you know, um, here you, you see um, those with, who are exposed to um, one or more adverse child, uh, one experience, 17% uh, indicated having fair or poor health then it kind of, there's a dose response and it jumps to 21%. Uh, uh, depression is 12% uh, for one or more ACEs, one in three individuals with two or more ACEs say um, they, they, uh, uh, they have current depression. Uh, then we, when we talk about smoking, current smoker, we talk about one in almost one in four individuals who say they're current smokers um, and then heavy drinking. So um, you, see, you see the association, of course, this is um, what you have to understand is, of course, these are experiences that they have recollected uh, prior to, uh, you know, um, from their childhood. Um, so from a time sequence point, you know, um, you know, when you make an association, you can do this. And in an ideal world, had we had longitudinal or prospective cohort data, we could actually draw that causal link, um, you know, to be able to kind of really say, okay, we find that, and we already know there's plenty of evidence for that. But this is what our data is also sharing, even in a cross-sectional nature. Okay, now this is <clears throat> this is basically um, stratifying or kind of uh, uh, looking at health outcomes, adjusting for some of the uh, stratifiers you looked for in education income uh, by males and females. So, you know, do ACEs really uh, differ between men and women? So one or more ACEs um, is associated with fair or poor health for females, but not for males. Yeah, so you see this red line here that, that basically essentially tells you that you know, there's overlapping confidence intervals. Uh, so there's no association there, but you know, for females is there, it's, although it's kind of a small effect. When we look at depression, um, it is associated for both males and females um, um, and for smoking, okay? So when we're really talking about now substance use, mental health, um, you know, ad addictive behaviors, I wanted to kind of stop thinking about what, what, what really is happening here uh, uh, with respect to uh, that. Then with respect to heavy drinking, um, interestingly, uh, you know, the um, 
ACEs are associated with heavy drinking for males and not for females. I mean, I guess we don't have a whole lot of uh, uh, females or maybe that, no, we know there's a higher prevalence of binge drinking, but uh, you know, in terms of heavy drinking, the way uh, it's captured in birth is how you see that um, association for males, not for females in Delaware. So in summary, what I really wanted to kind of emphasize is the early uh, ACEs are known to play a critical role, uh, role during the life course and may help in health trajectories and outcomes. So in really thinking about prevention efforts, mitigation, I think what we really need to talk about is this whole life course, long-term policy investment strategies that promote better health outcomes for individuals and greater health of the population. They are intrinsically linked. You can't kind of you know decouple them and talk about one without the other. So, um, and then who who has to be the champion here? And I think you know more than often everybody looks at public health and what can public health do. But you know increasingly this is something that is so complex that you know we really need a multi-sectoral collaboration of our partnership, public private, with local community involvement to really develop a multi-generational trauma-informed approach to care. Um, and then with that, I'm going to kind of leave you guys with these two questions. Um, as being in Delaware, what opportunities do we see to reduce ACEs early in life? Um, and what do we see are the challenges? Thank you so much. Uh, with that, I will stop my presentation. And um, uh, I'll keep the slides on just in case if somebody wants to go back and then uh, I'll stop talking here for a second. Thank you so much, um, Khalil. That, that was a very comprehensive, thought provoking and heavy, as we've seen in the chat, it's a very heavy topic to talk about. But as we also see, there are opportunities, you know, as you say, for prevention. Um, I'd like to ask the group if you have any questions. We have a few minutes for questions, and then we're going to do a little breakout and, and follow up with these and some other prompts. Um, but for now, who, if anyone, would like to unmute themselves and, and pose a question? Um, I'm not sure if this is something that's planned, but are there plans to um, reach out to people through other means besides phone calls? I know that this is a larger national effort, but anything that you all know about? Are you, um, Laura, thank you for the question. Are you specifically referring to the, the way the survey is done or? Um, yeah. Okay, so. <clears throat> Just to kind of give you a background, uh, the male surveys, I mean, there are, there are other methodologies that people have explored um, and increasingly there's one particular area, but uh, for the large part, um, you know, this is, this is what you call the random digit dialing interviews. Um, and, and that's what major, a lot of the health, national health service kind of go through, except for, I think, you know, you know, you have the census of course, and then um, other surveys um, that have explored what we call the address-based sampling to kind of increase um, your response rate. Um, that's a methodology that um, CDC has previously explored. Um, I know a lot of the other stuff, but usually um, there, you know, um, there has not been so much of success, um, in, you know, in certain places. And so kind of adopting a national strategy has been a challenge. Um, I think we really kind of need to look into other states um, in terms of what, what we could probably possibly adapt um, um, to see how we can increase the response rates. But I think for now and for the future, this is going to be the dominant method. Uh, so I don't know if that helps, but that's how we're asking. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? I actually, um, I do have a couple of questions. One is that um, this is the data for Delaware. Uh, I know that this is an elective module um, of questions and therefore there isn't, 
like you can't do the national comparison, you know, like you can look at the Delaware numbers, but you can't do the national comparison. I know previously there was, um, I think it was an MMWR report that was uh, based on earlier data collection among the states that did the ACEs module. Um, do you know if there's anything in the works to, um, to update that information or um, something where we could take a look at where we are in terms of the nation with some of these indicators? And then the second question I have, and I believe Dale is on the call, Dale Godine, um, thank you for sharing out this, this BRFAS data. Is there a plan to repeat um, at any sort of regular interval the ACEs module? Um, at this time for the Delaware Burfus? I, I think each year uh, that the uh, Burfus is conducted, it, it's always, everything is taken under consideration. Um, what I don't think that everybody may quite understand here is the Burfus questionnaire that's received, uh, it, it comes with a set of questions that we're required to ask and they're considered the core module questions. There's also um, a list of questions that uh, they call those the optional module questions and from those uh, some of them they some of them go back and forth from a core mo a required core module set of questions um, from one year and they're on a rotating cycle um, the the simplest way for me to to explain it is each year we get more questions than we can we have funding for so there's always competing priorities about what questions are taken into consideration. Um, there are some programs that provide some funding. Um, it, basically, they want those questions to be included in the BRFIS and they're gonna pay for those questions to be in the BRFIS. So, um, you know, we're certainly interested um, in those opportunities as it relates specifically to ACEs. Um, here again, each and every year, these questions, every question and every module is on, gets given serious consideration. Um, and certainly in the current COVID pandemic environment, there's a tremendous amount of competing priorities for 2022. Uh, we are definitely in the, in the process of developing the questionnaire for 2022 and, and we're certainly interested in wanting to include them if we can. Thank you. Thank you. Other questions? Dr. Husseini, um, Eileen Sparling put a question in the chat around whether or not um, anyone had looked at um, the disability population um, and their disproportionate experiences. And just trying to see if, if, if you knew of any research or if that was something that Delaware was interested in looking into with the BRFIS data. And Eileen, I hope I, I, hope I represented your question well. Um, th th thank you, Laura. Um, I think, you know, uh, I, I can look into, I mean, you've seen the distribution. I can probably see if we have, I, I, I can't, I don't want to kind of uh, misspeak, but um, I don't know if we've had a lot of visibility questions, but if so, you know, you know, if we have it, I would definitely um, put some information out and share it to the group, uh, definitely. Um, so that's one question. Um, the second one, I think, I think Sharon, you had asked about, uh, uh, you know, uh, the one question about the national comparison data and, and what is CDC planning to do. So like Dale mentioned, um, so um, there, there's a lot of competition to get your questions in nationally. It, it's, it's a, it's a um, just because of the costs and the surveillance mechanism um, and the trends and what people are actually doing, it always has been an optional module. I think Early on, when they really wanted to establish um, and get a national estimate on prevalence estimates, they tried to do that um, nationally. But you know, you know, uh, they kind of go through different. You know, it can never become a part of a core module, um, if I were to use the word, uh, simply because um, because you know, um, just because of the nature of the questions and you know, kind of repeating that in their every cycle, so that that's part of the thing. I don't know what will happen moving forward, um, you know, after COVID, uh, they might probably, there may be a uh, likelihood that they might do that. So I can't speak to that. The second part is, I know there have been some states who have um, done ACEs this year, um, and 
Um, the only way to kind of do a comparative analysis with other states is to actually request data from those states uh, and then kind of, uh, you know, populate those responses. And usually that means some states like Arizona, where, you know, I you know, moved originally from, they have their data sets right on the website. So I can just go download it and do it. Um, the core module data set is available for all states to access um, on the CDC website. But for the state specific modules, you have to usually go to the state specific coordinator to be able to access that data. Um, so with that saying that, you know, some states that I know, one of my colleagues who's in Oregon, she, um, she had reached out because um, early on, we'd done this analysis using our um, Delaware local survey, if you would collect from the Public Health Corporation um, when I first did this presentation. Uh, similar to Burfus, um, they reached out to me to kind of find out uh, when they uh, did this analysis. I know Oregon has done, um, I can't remember other states, and but you know, I can I can definitely explore that option uh, to see if other states are willing to share that information or if it's available so that we can compare how Delaware fares with respect to other states. Um, I, I believe I answered both the question. I think Dale answered the uh, whether or not the um, questions are going to be repeated. And I, I agree 100% um, with Dale. It, it, it's a big challenge in, in the cost factor. And you also look at the response rates and that's something that one of the things that people are as a, um, administratively look at is, you know, are we going to start seeing more declining, more lower response rates because of inclusion and whatnot and how that impacts your, your core items that we want to do. And sometimes, um, like in YRBS, you know, you have to meet certain thresholds to be included in the national estimates. Um, so far, Burfus has not done that, but, you know, we, you know, we don't want to be left out because of really poor response rate out of the national count. So that, that's another, I guess, competing challenge. Well, thank you. Um, so, Laura, do we have time to go into breakout room for about five minutes? I was not tracking time. Oh, okay. um. <laughs> I was caught up in the presentation. Um, I, I think we do have about five minutes to go into breakout room and to ask um, a couple of prompt questions. Um, let, so, um, we're back. I, I hope everybody made their way back into the main session. I always hope for that. Um, just really briefly, one of the things that we noted in our group is that even though, um, you know, kids might be asked about a specific behavior, such as gambling or substance use, and what questions they may have, they sort of intuitively and organically connect it to trauma. And we'll start talking about traumatic things that are in their lives, like incarceration or um, the violence in the community or poverty or, or items like this. So even on an intuitive level, young, very young people are making these connections between adverse experiences, trauma, and risk. Um, Laura, do you, are you a spokesperson for your group? Did you wanna just give a brief report out? Yeah, I think we, I was with a really fabulous group and everyone had a slightly different lens of how um, ACEs impacts their day-to-day -day work. Um, with the communities they work with or the specific populations, whether that be um, infusing ACEs and like an ACEs lens into different training. And Dr. Stevens talked about how ACEs is a really popular motivator for dissertation topics for his students um, and also how it informs programming. So a lot of really great and wonderful responses um, about the good work people are doing to help mitigate the impact of ACEs and yeah. we'll understand it more. Great. Did we have another? Did we have another breakout room that somebody would like to report out on? Yeah, sure. Um, so our our session started out with a couple of questions that hopefully someone can answer. You can just throw those answers in the chat. Um, one of them was, you know, what other languages are is the Burfus available in? So if you call up someone and they're going to be speaking to you in something else, can you actually conduct the you know the interview? Um, and the other was, you know, if if indeed I wanted to, you know, get a question on the Burfus, how much would it cost me? And, you know, a little bit about what that process might entail um, in addition to just having some, some cash available. Um, and then there was some discussion around the importance of bringing together Burfus data with other data sources that are associated with social determinants of health to inform 
you know, actions to be taken because, you know, your environment is so significant and, you know, how you view your life and how you view what you're going to do with it and, you know, the actions you're going to take if you've had, you know, negative experiences in early childhood. Um, and so the other, the other point was, you know, it would be important to bring in people that are sort of on the ground and in there working directly with them to help make sure that the translation of what we're finding um, is, is, used, is used well and effectively. Of course, great. I think um, what I'm going to do now, because I'm looking at the clock, and of course we've had robust discussion as we always do. So I'm going to segue now because I don't want to run short on time for the RPE presentation, Cheryl. Um, and I want to make sure we have time for to, time to listen to this information. I'm going to do a very brief introduction uh, and hand it off to you. Um, as I think many of you know, Dr. Cheryl Ackerman is the um, uh, she's a scientist at the Center uh, for Drug and Health Studies. She's also been at the university for over 20 years. She was the um, the director of evaluation on a number of national institutes of health and national science foundation grants. And she currently is lead on the um, evaluation project that we have with uh, the Division of Public Health and the Rape Prevention and Education Program, uh, specifically about building evaluation capacity. On the same project is our graduate research assistant and PhD candidate, Rachel Schilling. They're going to report on this particular project. A few years ago, they talked about the development of the framework for looking at this um, initiative um, using the CDC's um, social ecological perspective. Since then, they have fleshed out this framework. They have piloted this data collection and they're going to report back on the experience of that as well as some of the findings. I think I've done a pretty good summary of your presentation, but if I haven't, please correct me. I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl now. Okay, so I am going to share my screen and get this up and going. Come on, there we go. So thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. Um, very much appreciated. And um, so yes, you did a fine job. And I guess I will add to that, that Sharon is also part of this RPE evaluation team as our sort of expert advisor. She used to be the PI on this project for the evaluation element. Um, so, no, sorry. So a couple of things I wanted to say is that we did produce a, a report on the data associated with this project. Um, however, it is not available for, for distribution to everyone. So we've included a fair number, a, 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 a large amount of information in this presentation, some of which we will just flick by rapidly and is available for your reference. So we did that intentionally because we wanted to make sure that you had all of the information since it's really not available anywhere else. Um, and we will be sharing the slides after, after the presentation. So, you know, just be aware of that. Okay, so Rachel Schilling, who as Sharon said, is the a graduate research assistant on the project is gonna start us out by talking about um, sort of the history and the development of this project. So take it away, Rachel. Thank you. So the RPE program, which is funded by the CDC through Delaware Public Health, coordinates with the Delta Impact Grant to form a state leadership team. And the team is made up of stakeholders from across the state interested in sexual violence prevention from a variety of sectors, including public health, criminal justice, education, prevention, and others. And next slide, please. And the priority of RPE and the state leadership team are to create community and societal change towards sexual violence prevention. And our, um, our CDAS team's main contribution is the indicator project, which is intended to identify and track measures related to sexual violence in Delaware to monitor prevention efforts and improvement over time. Next slide, please. And we have um, the project kind of broken down into four main phases, which you can see here, and I'll be going over. Next slide, please. The first phase, um, we just kind of chose frameworks to guide the overall project. 
which ended up being the socio-ecological framework, life course, and social determinants of health. We also conducted 22 key informant interviews with members of the state leadership team and other stakeholders around Delaware to inform us regarding potential data sources and important indicators that we should be tracking. Last, we performed an extensive um, literature review of potential indicators and risk and protective factors of sexual violence, keeping in mind those three frameworks. Next slide. Um, and then we did phase two, which um, included selecting data sources and measures to track sexual violence and risk and protective factors of sexual violence over time. And in order to keep the project sustainable, we had these certain, certain uh, criteria in mind, selecting sources of data, including being supported by literature, which was that lit review we did in phase one, being collected over time, either yearly or every other year, being reliable and trustworthy, being publicly accessible. So we relied heavily on um, like data tools online or reports, and then being helpful in providing an overall picture of Delaware's progress toward preventing sexual violence at those community and societal levels. We also created a system to track data over time, and we did this using Excel. Our next slide, thank you. And then in phase three, we pilot the data collection. So we uh, refined our data sources and measures and we developed a data collection guide to assist in the process. It just kind of detailed everything that one needed to do to collect data. Um, then refining our process, we swapped out indicators that were no longer collected. We found ways to display and interactive data and we grappled with um, COVID -related, related data gaps, which I'm sure we weren't the only ones to do that. And then, um, next slide please. As you can see through the various phases, we cut down drastically on the number of measures and indicators of sexual violence that we originally planned to track. And we made these choices for a variety of reasons, either for data integrity, because the measure is no longer collected or to decrease redundancy. So we may have had two um, measures that we thought were important, but kind of decided they were really getting at the same thing, among other reasons. Next slide, please. So we have our indicators sort of organized by risk or protective factor of sexual violence. And these are then organized into larger priority areas of the RPE project, which are prevalence, child protective environments, and women's financial empowerment. Next slide, please. And then this is where Shart will be picking up. Thank you for that introduction, Rachel. Um, it was a, a long process uh, over a couple of years to go through. And, you know, as you let me just quickly flick back up here, as you can see under the broad column at the top, you'll see we started with 134 measures that we could have possibly included, which even if they were all fantastic and available and wonderful, there's just no way we could have included them all because it would have been too burdensome because this project is intended to be um, sort of taken on by others and um, sustained over time. And so if it's, too, it's, if it's too burdensome, then that simply won't happen. So we did reduce it down to 66, which is still plenty. Um, uh, and we reduced the number of sources because we figured, you know, the fewer places you have to go look, then the easier it is for you to do it, instead of having 18. So uh, just a couple of other comments uh, to make. So the data, and as you, you, you could see from all of those indicators, um, there's, there's a fair amount of it. Um, what I'm gonna show you next is a series of slides um, that are organized by the three main topics. And within each topic, um, it'll go by indicators. And within each indicator, there is the set of measures. And for each indicator, there's at least one slide that is a table that summarizes the information. And then a series of figures um, that show trends over time. Um, we try to include the most recent three data points available so that we could indeed look at trends. Uh, that was not always possible, but we, we, that, was, that was our goal. Um, and of course, as Rachel mentioned, you know, COVID did impact a few things. And so that will come up here and there. So first, what I wanna do is our first topic, which is prevalence. I just wanna show you this because I'm going to skip over the rest of these because they're just not really 
you know, we don't need to talk about all of them, but just so you can see, this is one of the ways we, we presented the information. So for uh, prevalence, our first indicator is policing and policing has two, very, uh, two measures, reported forcible sex offenses and domestic violence police contacts, both from the crime in Delaware report. And looking at the table, you can see that the data was collected at least similar timeframes, not exactly, um, we use spark lines to be able to show in a quick little, you know, line graph uh, what the trend looked like over time. Um, uh, the most recent year's value for the measure and the most recent change. So we can get a sense of, you know, what's happened most recently. Um, and we thought this would be helpful to those people that we were presenting the information to um, for reporting. But as I said, this is... This is not what I'm going, I'm going to flip through these. What I will spend more time on are the figures. So within the indicator of policing, here are the domestic violence um, variables um, that we included. So we have two, the reported forcible sex offenses and domestic violence police contacts again. And um, if you ignore the 2020 date, data on the figure on the right, you can see that the trends for the two aren't exactly the same. There isn't a whole lot of change happening, but what you do see is that the forcible, the reported forcible sex offenses is going down slightly, whereas the domestic violence police context is going up slightly. Um, so, you know, I'm not really, you know, we don't necessarily have explanations for all of these things that we see in the data. We, we can, however, just, you know, note them. So moving on. So again, I'm just going to skip through those. So the next, um, the next indicator in prevalence is resource use. And we have thing, we have a, a variety of sort of subsets of measures. One focuses on interpersonal violence. Um, so what we see here are really five different variables that include batterer treatment commitments served, um, protection from abuse orders, individuals housed in domestic violence shelters and domestic violence hotline calls. And all of this data comes from the DVCC annual report. What I want to focus on are the two on the right, the actual use of, you know, the shelters and the hotline calls, both of which were, you know, one was clearly on a downward trend, the hotline calls, and the other, um, the shelter use was not really on a downward trend, but it was, it was sort of fluctuating a little, hovering around a certain area. But we definitely saw a change dramatically in 2020 with a, a real uptick for both of those. Um, and that, that seems noteworthy. And, and in discussions we had had with the leadership on this project, um, the state leadership on this project, you know, there was talk about the fact that, well, you know, people were being, were, were being unable to leave their homes. And so whatever situations they were in at home, if they were problematic and, you know, then that is why we see these uh, increases in, in use. So if we move on to teen victimization, teen sexual violence. So uh, teen victimization includes four measures related to sexual violence among teens, and that all comes from the YRBS. Um, and one of the measures was only first used in 2017. So you can see that, you know, this one little orange dot here, and we'll see what happens with that later on. Um, but what we do see is um, a, a downward trend for teens experience of sexual violence by their partners. Um, so if we look over here, teen dating violence, and what I do want to say about the teen dating violence is that is within the context of a dating relationship. So all of this is, you know, if you are, if you were in a relationship, did this happen? And what we see is that we have different trends for sexual assault by partner and physical assault by partner with one sort of being pretty, you know, static, maybe going up ever so slightly and the other um, heading downward. Um, whereas 
when we look at sexual assault ever, again, also, you know, ever so slightly, would I call that a, a real significant change? No, not really. What I do want to point out here is because when I was looking at this data, I was rather confused about how it would be possible for the measure of sexual assault ever to have a lower percentage than sexual assault in the last 12 months, because one would be subsumed under the other. So I went and talked with Rachel because she is the one who actually knows all of the nitty gritty details about these things, because she works much more with this data. And um, what we realized was we probably need to change the descriptors for these variables because they are indeed looking at different things. So um, I did write it down. So sexual assault, sexual um, assault ever is specifically asking about intercourse, whereas sexual um, assault in the last 12 months um, is just talking about sexual things. So it didn't necessarily specify uh, intercourse. So therein lies the reason why these, these don't align exactly because the questions were not, you know, they weren't asking about the same behaviors. So we'll move on to topic two, which is child protective environments for which there are five indicators. The first of which is access to healthcare. Um, and so we have two measures that are associated with mental health. One is whether or not mental health care was received and uh, the other is whether or not they needed mental health care but were not able to access it, they didn't receive it. And um, what we see for both of the, the measures is slight dec decline from 2017 to 2018. Um, and clearly there are far fewer um, children who have need and are not receiving services. So I'm, I'm glad there are less of those, um, but still it's, you know, it's, we'd like to see everyone who needs help receive help, obviously. So if we move on to physical health, we look at children without health insurance and children receiving preventative health care. And there's not a whole lot of change happening regarding health insurance. There's a slight uptick in 2018, but you know, not, not much to speak of. However, we do see a downward trend over the same time period in children, the percentage of children receiving preventative health care. So, you know, it, we don't really know what to make sense of here in those terms, because if the same number of children actually are, have health insurance, um, then why would fewer of them be receiving preventative health care? And it's not an insignificant drop from 89% down to about 79% uh, over a two year period. That's, you know, a 10% drop. So, you know, what, what is going on there? So the next, well, we just spent a lot of time talking about ACEs and mental health care, but that's so, <laughs> I'm not sure I really need to say a whole lot. Um, we've pretty much, I think, seen this data. So looking at this from 2015 to 2017, um, it's pretty stable again. Um, and we see, you know, one fifth to one quarter-ish of students reporting um, one ACE or two plus ACEs during that time frame, which, you know, that's a lot. Uh, we have an interest, or at least, you know, there, there's interest in and in having a better understanding of this two plus ACEs, you know, but my understanding is that as it increases, the number increases, um, it does start to peter off, um, which, I, which is, I guess, what you would want to, want to see. We, we, yes, fewer is definitely better. Um, and then we have two measures that focus on depression in high school. One that asks about sort of a standard um, definition of someone who would be experiencing depression, which is you know whether or not they felt sad or hopeless just about every day for two weeks in a row that impacted um, their usual activities. It prevented them from doing their usual activities. And what we see here is that we have an upward trend from 2013 to 2017. 
And a similar trend those same years for the other measure, which is, you know, what percentage of students in high school had made plans, to, had made a plan to commit suicide. And, you know, it really scares me to see that more than 10% of our, you know, high school students surveyed had made a plan to commit suicide. Um, and, you know, my, my apologies for the terminology. I know we're using different phrasing for around um, suicide these days. This is just how it's, it's, it's worded in, in the YRBS. Um, and what's particularly important here is that this is all before COVID. And we know that COVID had such a negative impact on the mental health of, well, most people, I think, um, that, you know, we would expect looking at more recent data that this was, is going to go up. But the fact that there was a, an upward trend already, you know, should, should have us thinking a little bit about that. So poverty and economic factors. What I really wanna mention here, again, some of this I think is less relevant to the audience um, today, but of course it's all included in the slide set is the total teen births. You know, how, how is that looking? And between 2015 and 2018, we saw a, an upward tick, but um, it seems to be coming down. So we've gone down from 583 teen, total teen births to 900, and, uh, sorry, to 497 in 2018. So, you know, those are, those are things we would like to see. In terms of safety uh, for children protective environments, we're looking at protective family routines and habits as well as supportive neighborhoods. And there's all of this text on there because I just figured I would give it to you. <laughs> um, there are long explanations for these composite measures and um, I just thought it would be helpful to, to include them. So protective family routines and habits, take a look at what's going on in the home for children of certain ages. Um, and you know, you can see there that it varies. It talks about you know not using household tobacco um, in the home, that the family shares meals four more days a week, that watching television and time on computers is less than two hours a week, uh, two hours a day, um, and and there are other specific measures. And what we see though is that you know just over ten percent of ooh sorry just over ten percent of families. Um, are, you know, have protective family routines and habits. Um, whereas supportive neighborhoods, we see about 50% of families um, are reporting having a supportive neighborhood in which people, you know, help each other out and watch out for each other's children and, and, and things of that nature. Um, so if we talk about violence and bullying perpetration, so there are several measures of bullying um, that come from different sources that include both, you know, that include parents, schools, and the students themselves. Uh, bullying reported by parents, we see in 2018 was the only data point that we had. 3.7% of parents reported that their child was a perpetrator of bullying and about three times as many um, reported that their child had experienced bullying, been a victim of bullying. Then we look here and we see bullying reported in schools. Um, this significant drop, we, we had more years here because we wanted to know what on earth had happened and if that was just a sudden thing. Um, there, was some, um, there was some effort put in to try and reduce bullying in schools, there were some initiatives and um, that had an impact on what was being reported. Then we see what students are actually reporting themselves and we see downward trends for both um, high school students and middle school students from 2013 to 2019. And more on violence. So this is family and community violence. We have three different measures. And mostly what we see here is that there is some fluctuation over time for some of these variables. Um, whether they've witnessed violence between adults at home, it seems to be the, the least often reported. 
uh, for both eighth graders and 11th graders. Um, but the variables of, you know, saying, commenting on student violence and uh, violence in their neighborhood or crime in their neighborhood, um, kind of, uh, there's no, there's not a lot of trending happening. So topic three, um, women's financial empowerment also has five indicators, um, most of which I'm, I'm going to sort of move past as being less relevant. This is one I wanted to spend some, you know, a, a moment on, which is talking about the percentage of income spent on childcare. And we have the figure on the left, which talks about married couples versus the right, which is single parents. And looking at different configurations of families, which is, you know, married with an infant, two children, uh, or two children um, at the poverty line, um, you can just see how dramatically, you know, living at the poverty line affects the percentage of money that you're spending on um, childcare. I mean, you're looking at, you know, 80% of your income. Um, and when you're looking at a single parent, you're seeing one third to two thirds of income being spent on childcare, depending on the age of your child. So that's pretty, pretty significant and something to be, you know, looked at. I'm just gonna skip over, we have women's and babies healthcare that, um, did I skip that access to healthcare? I'm sorry. Um, ACEs in mental health, um, I didn't have any, we didn't have anything to report because we were looking at how to get data that made the most sense for what we were reporting. Um, looking at everyone wasn't going to be as helpful to us. So we hadn't quite sorted that out in time for reporting, but we will in the future. Poverty and economic factors, I'm not really gonna go over, but births to single mothers, this was really the only set of, this was really the only measure that we disaggregated by, um, really by much of anything other than, I guess, age of students um, or grade level. So, and we did this because I had a sneaking suspicion that there were going to be some disparities based on um, age, based on um, race, ethnicity of the, the women we were looking at. And as you can see, there's a, the, the black women seem to have the highest percentage of, or, or excuse me, let me, let me go back. I always have to go back to my interpretation, which is of all women who gave birth in the age group, what proportion were single? So the proportion of women who were single giving birth among black women is the highest across the board. Um, and we see that, you know, if we look at births to single mothers, the total, which is on the lower, the lower figure, um, we start to see the percentage for white women creeping down. And while it's not shown here, when we looked at the older groups, it was even more disparate. So women from black or Hispanic um, that were black are black or Hispanic have a higher percentage um, giving birth when as single as single women. And the last binge drinking um, substance use, we see pretty consistent uh, percentage being reported across 2016 to 2018. So I know that was really quick and probably not as quick as I would have liked it to be. So apologies for taking a little longer. Um, survey people. So we have some next steps, um, which I'm just gonna go through. You know, I'm, I'm only gonna mention the first one because I'm hoping you can help us. Um, we're going to be surveying people in, who work in organizations that have something to do with sexual violence. And if you are one of those people or you know of individuals, um, we would like to include you because we want to go beyond the people specifically involved in our project. Um, so we're going to be asking them which of these measures inform their organization's work and which of these measures should their work, if done well and effectively, impact. And so if you are a person or you know of someone, please either throw a name and an email in the chat. Um, Rachel's going to be tallying that up or you can email us directly. Um, we would appreciate that. Questions, comments, and I don't know how we, you know, so questions or comments, and we have a couple of questions just to spark discussion. 
um, if you feel like it or any questions that you might have. Thank you very much for your time. Um, Thank you, Cheryl. I, I really appreciate it, Cheryl and Rachel. Um, we have run long as we always do. My apologies. That's okay. No, I mean, in general, the entire, the entire meeting has run long. Um, I do want to reiterate that um, if you are um, interested in participating, you can, um, we will follow up with this request for folks to be interviewed or to contribute to the um, ongoing development of the project when we send out the materials for the uh, for the for the today's meeting when we send out the slides we will have Cheryl's contact information on there so that you can reach out to her should you have an interest in participating I'm going to thank you that was a very comprehensive and I know it was a very quick overview of the process um, if uh, I think uh, there's one question in the chat um, Deb Berkey from Will Mew has asked if you have reached out to folks from all the institutes of higher education um, for their input. So if you haven't, that sounds like, I, I do believe that Will Mew was one of the groups that you did access in your interviews, but um, possibly others, there may be others. Um, I'd also be curious to know a little more about what she means by access and, and whether she means like make sure that they know that they're going could be invited to participate in the survey or involved in discussions or or anything like that. Um, what what exactly? Deb, can you unmute yourself and and, and clarify? Uh, I'll try. I've had internet connectivity issues, so I may be, I don't know if you're making at we the can. moment. We can. Okay, excellent. Good. I got it. At the moment. No, I'm thinking, um, yeah, inviting um, all the institutes to the conversation, whether it's for data collection, whether it's for participating, however you might want them to participate. Um, I think it's important to, to keep them as part. And I know on our campus in particular, we had, um, have a lot of information, a lot of data. Deb, you are cutting out. I would echo, I think, Deb's overall sentiment with engaging higher ed, um, student wellness and health promotion on UD's campus. Does a lot of work, including, I think, bystander intervention that Dr. Husseini also mentioned that's happening in, um, in Arizona. Well, I don't quote me on that. I know this is being recorded, so I probably shouldn't have said it, but I think they do bystander intervention with sexual violence. I know they do it in other areas as well. Yeah, that's great. Well, um, we are at time, so we know that some folks may need to jump off, but I do want to just give a couple minutes. If anyone in the network has any announcements that they want to make and you're able to stay on, I would invite you to unmute yourselves at this time and, and share out whatever. And before I do that, though, I do want to say if Dr. Gloria James is on the call still, I know that you are very close to a magical date of retirement, um, I think at the end of this week. And um, you know how we feel about you and your work and your advocacy for uh, using the data, for gathering data, and for really using it to inform healthcare efforts in Delaware, particularly um, in the student wellness centers and other places. So I wanna thank you and wish you the best on behalf of the SEOW team. I am getting emotional right now, Sharon. Uh, I hope there's some kind of way that I can still get some of the information from this group. Oh my goodness, I, I just, I don't know. I, I, I'm just getting emotional, so thank you. I, I feel that it's been a privilege being a part of this group and seeing how we've grown. Because we've gone from just narrative reporting or people reporting their own data to actually integrating data. That has been the most exciting part, so thank you. Well, you've been a big part of that, and thank yeah. you. So. Thank you. And congratulations. Yeah. Other folks that might want to chime in with any announcements. Um, Maybe programs that might be coming up or resources yeah. that the, the group may enjoy. I'm going to throw something out there. This is Karen McLaughlin. Um, I have it on fairly good authority that the what we keep calling the indicators project through RPE that has helped fund some of the work that UD is doing 
um, it started out, it was just going to be a four year program. And they, they, they being the CDC has a fair amount of confidence that they'll continue to fund that work. And so what I would love to um, encourage and embrace is some conversation in, you know, future months uh, over the next year, in fact, of, you know, what would you like to see? What kind of indicators would you like us to look at? What kind of data would you like us to pull around sexual violence? And is, are there any data sets or whatever that you think we might not be tapping into that you think would contribute? You know, so I, I would just like to see more conversations so that we can create the products that will be used and, um, you know, sort of grow and progress with this with this work that the CDC is funding. Thank you for that, Karen. Um, again, I think we can include in what we send out to the network, um, we can include a statement about that. And, you know, you can articulate it with Cheryl, what you would like to say about that. And if there's an ask in particular, we can certainly cir circulate that to the network, which is got over 100 members and it represents about 50 different agencies. And then certainly um, people are free to circulate that out amongst their networks that they think might be uh, interested in the work um, and relevant to the work. And then just one last comment, shout out to you, Sharon, who started all this work and Cheryl and Rachel who have continued it. I really appreciate it. It's been really a fascinating project to see how it grew because it was kind of I'm just going to say it was a little amorphous in the beginning. You're right. It was iffy yeah. for a while there. Right. Right. But uh, hats off to the CDC in the sense of them, you know, like I really appreciate that concept of understanding cross cutting risk and cross cutting protective factors and the need to look more broadly when we evaluate. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, if no one else has anything else that they would like to share before we wrap up, I just want to thank everyone for participating today. I want to thank our speakers. You were fabulous. Um, I want to thank the team here at the SEOW and the center for all of the background work that goes on before these meetings and during these meetings. I want to give a special shout out to David for managing all the technology and for Bill for populating in the chat the entire time. Um, these links to different resources that are relevant to the conversations that we've had today. The question came up, we do put together a document of these links, we send those out, um, we post them, I should say, and we send the link out for the, for the slides, we send the link out for the recording, remember that this is recorded, so if you have colleagues that weren't able to attend today that you would think might enjoy it, certainly let them know about it. Um, and um, while you're there, if there are other presentations that you haven't seen, we've been posting our materials on a YouTube channel. So we have that um, for anybody that wants to go ahead and, and take a look at some former materials. Um, what we're looking at now is preparing for our next meeting, which will come up very quickly, I'm sure. We have two of these network meetings a year. Uh, the next one is most likely going to be in January, possibly February of next year. Uh, I hate to make a prediction about whether we'll be in person as well as virtual, but we'll definitely be virtual. If, if nothing else, we will definitely be online for those meetings. We will, we will have at least one more 3D before the end of the year, which is a more focused webinar and open to the public on different aspects of data. As always, this is your SEOW. We want to know what you all want to hear about, what you want to share data on, please continue to keep us informed about your needs. We will continue to reach out. Um, thanks to everyone. I hope you have a wonderful week. Laura, do you have anything you'd like to add before we end? No, I really enjoyed seeing everyone and hearing the presentation. So thank you guys and thank everyone for a robust discussion and your continued involvement in the SEOW. Thanks everyone. Take care and have a great week. <laughs>